So if, if you weren't already uh, impressed at the, the boldness and the faithfulness of, of somebody so young, I'll tell you two extra things. Uh, the first is that Noah has a broken rib right now. And I said, hey, like, do you want to go a different Sunday so you can, you know, breathe? And he's like, no, no, it has to be this Sunday. Okay. <laughs> and secondly, um, Noah, one of the things that I love about him so much um, and, and Levi and guys like them is that when we were on our mission trip in Milwaukee, uh, things were not going exactly as we had hoped that they would. And um, Noah and Levi are, are the kind of guys who said, we're going to do this meaningless, menial task that they kind of made up for us because they weren't ready for us as quickly as we possibly can so that we can use our free time this afternoon to hit the streets of Milwaukee and hand out Bibles and share the gospel, right? So that's the kind of person he is and, and some of the other guys that he has alongside him. So I, I hope that that was encouraging to you. I hope that uh, you hear the message of the gospel um, through the testimony of one like Noah. Uh, with that, we're going to move into uh, the sermon for this morning, and because it's a little bit longer of a Sunday with the addition of Noah's amazing testimony, and I don't want anyone falling asleep on me, I want to do something a little different this morning, and would you please just stand for the reading of the Word, if you're able. If you're not, that's quite all right, but please stand if you're able, and we'll read the Word together. All right, I'm going to read to you from James 5, 1 through 6. And it goes like this. Now listen, you rich people. Weep and wail because of the misery that is coming to you. Your wealth has rotted and moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. Look, the wages you failed to pay the workers who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. You have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened yourselves in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the innocent one who is not opposing you. Amen. You may be seated. So that's a cheery follow-up passage of Scripture to a <laughs> testimony. Probably equally as cognitively dissonant that you hear it coming from someone dressed like me. Um, if you don't know, Mike Sells is the Hawaiian shirt guy. I have a couple of, in my, of them in my own closet now because of him, as does Pastor Andrew, and so I thought it only right to wear it as we celebrate Mike Sells today, as we uh, hold with an open hand the ministry that he's done here and, and uh, bless him as he goes off into future ministry endeavors. Uh, but, so I will say, we don't always dress like this. Uh, if this is your first time here and you're looking for pastors that are always serious, you might want to keep looking. Um, <laughs> so that's all I got on that. When I was a freshman in high school, uh, I saw maybe what is probably the most crass, inappropriate, vulgar movie ever produced. And actually, I looked it up, and that movie currently holds the record for the most profanity ever used in a single screenplay. That movie was called The Wolf of Wall Street. I'm saying this next part not just because I'm a pastor and I'm supposed to, but from my own real experience, please, please, for the love of all things holy, do not let your teenagers watch that movie. I mean, I don't really recommend it for adults either, but especially do not let your teenage boys watch that movie. Because the way that the movie portrays language and sexuality and domestic violence borders on glorification of those things, and it was very misleading for a 15-year-old pre-meeting Jesus me. But today, I want to start with one particular aspect on whom the movie is based upon, a man named Jordan Belfort, and on his pursuit of wealth. And so we're going to talk about his actual story, not the movie story. And if you've ever heard it, Jordan Belfort grew up in New York in the 60s and the 70s. He made some money as a kid by selling popsicles at the beach with his cousin, enough money to put himself through college to earn a degree in biology. He married his high school sweetheart. He was planning to attend dentistry school. But, and listen very closely here because this is important. On the first day of dentistry school, when the dean was speaking to the new students and said that pursuing dentistry was not going to make anyone rich, 
Belfort immediately dropped out. This began his attempts, uh, this began his attempt at his hand in business, which initially did not go well. He was laid off from his first brokerage job when the market crashed. The whole time, his wife Denise was incredibly supportive, his high school sweetheart, even when they filed for bankruptcy. And by 1991, Belfort had begun his own brokerage firm with a man named Danny after being introduced by Danny's wife, who noticed that Belfort was nice and always gave up his spot on the bus for her. This nice guy who works to put himself through college. But Belfort and Danny, in their pursuit of wealth, quickly realized that they could make more money through illegal business practices that involve manipulating the market, taking the profits, and then letting it crash back down, leaving the everyday investors to suffer the losses. And so began his personal downward spiral. <clears throat> Jordan and Denise divorced after six years of marriage as his hustle scheme began to take off when he became wrapped up in affairs with other women and became addicted to hard drugs. Eventually, Belfort would marry a model, have two kids with her, subsequently get divorced after kicking her down the stairs and driving through their garage door and hitting a marble pillar in their driveway while high on drugs with their three-year-old daughter in the back seat of his Mercedes. Belford and his partners were eventually indicted on money laundering charges, causing them to lose their company, serve time in prison, and he now owes the victims of his schemes over $110 million. A complete and utter rock-bottom story for someone who thought he had it all for seven short years and then found out where chasing riches can truly take you. Now, I think I know you well enough to know that some of you are thinking right now one of two things. We either are about to get a sermon on how money is bad, in which case you probably disagree with me, or we're about to get a sermon that doesn't apply to us because we're not rich or we don't consider ourselves rich. You're like, oh, the passage from James is about rich people? That's great. I'm going to check out for the next 20 minutes. But here's the reality, and I'm not saying that any of you are at serious risk for going out and starting large-scale money laundering schemes. I mean, maybe you are, but I hope not. But if James is to be believed, and I think he is because we believe that God is speaking through him in his word, then I think all of us should take very seriously the warnings from the passage this morning. I'll be upfront and honest with you. I'm not here, I'm not here to guilt you into giving money from, to the church. I don't I don't care what you do with your money. Andrew and I particularly, I mean, I do care, but I'm not here to ask you to give your money to the church. Andrew and I never see the amounts that you give ever. I will never know what you give to the church or to other charitable organizations. I will never see that. I'm not here to take an offering. I'm here to, to teach from the truth of God's word in the book of James for us about money. And the truth is that if you make $34,000 annually, you're in the top 1% of the world. So the majority of the families in this room are already in the top 1% of earners in the world. And even if you don't make that much, all it takes is one misplaced priority to lead to even the least wealthy among us into the type of condemnation that James is speaking to here at the beginning of chapter 5. Have you ever found yourself wanting so badly, waiting so expectantly for the next best thing? The new iPhone, a new car, a new house, a pay raise or a promotion, and you're waiting for it so hopefully and expectantly, and then you get it, and it doesn't make all your problems go away like you thought it would? What in your life has the power to make you the most anxious or stressed? Or when you talk about feeling comfortable or secure in life, what are you referring to? Is it a 401k or a nice house or a car with high safety ratings? See, I don't have to see your pay stub to know that if you're like the majority of the people in the West, there are more times than you'd like to admit that money plays the role of comforter, of protector, of motivator, among other roles in your life that it was never intended to play. And if we're honest, all of us, have given money and the pursuit of wealth a seat of prominence in our hearts and minds that was only ever meant to be filled by Christ. And so this morning we're going to focus on three ways that wealth and the pursuit of wealth actually leads us into condemnation and away from the life that Jesus 
would have for us. And I understand that it's already 10 o'clock, which is usually when we end. And so I just am asking you to bear with me. Number one is that wealth oppresses when it takes the place of Jesus as our ultimate source of hope. Wealth oppresses when it takes the place of Jesus as our ultimate source of hope. Verses 1 through, say, 1 through 3 say, Now listen, you rich people, weep and wail because of the misery that is coming to you. Your wealth has rotted, and moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. And you'll notice today that all three points are going to start with wealth oppresses when. And that's because money and wealth in and of themselves are not what's evil. Money is morally ambiguous. It's a tool that can either be used for good or for bad. But because of our fallen nature, our tendency to selfishness, to idolatry, which just means putting anything above God in our lives, wealth can quickly transform into something that is no longer a tool, but actually a false god in our lives, dictating and controlling our hearts and our minds in ways that we are blind to even see until one day you wake up and everything the world says you should, you wake up with everything that the world says that you should value, and yet you have no idea who you are or why you're here or what your purpose in life is. So we know, reading Scripture, that this doesn't mean that we should just be lazy and not work. Proverbs 10.4 says, Lazy hands make for poverty, but diligent hands bring wealth. Clearly, the opposite of idolizing wealth and its pursuit is not laziness. God doesn't call us to be lazy. But there's an all-too-common attitude towards wealth that James is not simply warning against in James chapter 5, but actually actively condemning in the passage today. Not because he wants us to feel terrible about ourselves. He was condemning a specific group of people in the first century, specifically wealthy people, wealthy non-believers, but that there are truths for us today to be taken that actually should give us hope and point us back to Jesus. Money, James knows, is a particularly dangerous influence and should be treated with great care, according to Jesus, which we'll talk about more later. And so James instructs rich people, the unrighteous rich, you might call them. These are those who have pursued wealth through dishonest gain, who have made their wealth an idol, who have used their wealth to oppress others. He instructs them, he warns them, he even condemns them to weep and to wail for the miseries that are coming to them. The language of weeping and wailing mirrors the Old Testament warnings to people that opposed God about the day of the Lord. So there were warnings in the old, all throughout the Old Testament to people who are in opposition to God, and the warnings that come in this form are often warning them against what will happen to them when God returns. The day that Jesus comes back, the Bible says, is going to be a day of inexpressible joy and fulfillment for those who are made righteous before God in Christ, but a day of great pain and sorrow for those who have put their trust in the things of this world. Misery is coming to those who value money more than all else. It might show up on earth, and it might not. They might be the unrighteous rich, and they might live lives that look good all the way up until the day that they die. But there's a promise that those who pursue wealth above all else are going to receive misery. They may have a Jordan Belfort or even a Jeffrey Epstein situation where they get caught up in their dishonest pursuit of wealth, and they face earthly consequences, or they might not. But there is no tricking God. John Piper, a pastor in Minnesota, says that when he's asked how people can believe that God is good, when you see these immoral, rich people that seem to get away with everything and do whatever they want and hurt as many people because they don't care and because they can get away with crime due to their money, his response as to how he can still believe God is good in the face of so many good things happening to bad people is this, because I know that the righteous and holy God of the universe is storing up for them punishment at the final day that is in line with their wickedness and greed, and that on that day, no matter what took place during their earthly lives, all things will be made right again. That there will come a day when God is going to make things right. 
James, who is the half-brother of Jesus, our author, the half-brother of Jesus, teaches on money in almost exactly the same way Jesus teaches on money in the Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew 6, it says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermins do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Similarly, Paul teaches in 1 Timothy 6.17, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. And so James goes through riches, clothes, treasures, gold, silver, noting that every single one of them, all of the things that we tend to place our value in, both financially and socially and sometimes even morally, based off of the clothes that we wear and the cars that we drive and the homes that we live in, the number in our bank account, James says that all of it can go away in an instant. Interestingly, he even says that the gold and the silver have corroded or have rusted, which is odd because if you know anything about precious metals, gold and silver don't rust. And so some people try to argue that James wouldn't have known that gold and silver don't rust because he came from a working class background. But I think that the opposite is actually true, that James knows that gold and silver don't rust and that he's making the point that even the earthly things that seem the most secure— Even the things that seem the most like they will never perish and never fade. The things that we are most likely to put our faith in our hope in. That they can be taken away from you in an instant and ultimately will be taken away from you when you die. And so our hope has to be placed in something other than those things. Imagine with me for a moment that you won the lottery. This week I saw a post from a friend on Facebook that said, if you win tonight's Mega Millions, this was like Wednesday or Thursday, and took the cash option, not counting the taxes, you could spend $51,917.80 a day for the next 40 years before you ran out of money. For a little fun, let's say the government took 60% of your cash payout, but let's let's just pretend. That's still $20,767 a day that you could spend for the next 40 years before you ran out. Now, in this hypothetical where you win the Mega Millions, let's say that you're smart and instead of spending 27 k a day, you invest and you've got cash flow and you've got all the money in the world for the rest of your life and for the generations that follow you. And then one day you wake up and you go downstairs to your wife in your new mansion who's cooking breakfast. Maybe you give her a kiss, you grab a cup of coffee, you head out to the living room to greet your children. And you have a seizure between the kitchen and the living room and your kids watch as you're taken to the hospital where you wake up three days later and having been told, where you wake up three days later having been told that you have, have an inoperable brain tumor. And you look at your young daughter and think about how you won't get to walk her down the aisle someday or see her learn how to drive and you won't get to tell your son all the things that you wish you would have said and you won't get to grow old with your spouse There's no amount of money in the world that will matter to you in that moment. You might say, oh, well, at least my kids are provided for. Yeah, maybe financially, but the whole of a missing parent is one that no amount of money is ever going to be able to fill. The the whole of a father that didn't train their children up to know the Lord is a hole that nobody will ever be able to fill, and no amount of money can ever paper over that crack. Maybe that's too difficult for you to believe, that hypothetical. Most of us are not winning the lottery. This might seem morbid, though Andrew and I ask ourselves this question on a regular basis to make sure that we're leading the church in a way that is not entirely focused on us. So we ask ourselves this question. I'll ask you this question. What happens if you die on the way home from church today? Are there some things you would have done differently? Maybe spent some more time with the people that you care about most instead of letting things like money and, and jobs get in the way? Would you have put more of an effort into sharing your faith with your non-believing family members? When your life is at its lowest, no matter where that is in the timeline of your life, if your ultimate hope is in anything other than Jesus, then you actually don't have any hope at all. Money won't hold you when loved ones go astray. 
It won't pick you up when you're in the pits of despair. It won't restore your relationships with the people who are supposed to be the closest in your life. There is no hope in the face of a fallen world run by the unrighteous rich unless God is coming back to make it right. Because as much as money makes us think we're in control, God is the only one true sovereign and he is coming back. And on that day, there's no buying your way into heaven. There's no buying your family members' ways into heaven or anyone else's. The, the things that we've toiled to achieve and to gain, the false sense of security that we've lured ourselves into with things like savings accounts and retirements and investments and jobs and status and power, none of it's going to matter when every knee is forced to bow before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. The, the material things on earth that they held, the unrighteous rich hold most dear, will be ripped from them in a moment. And that can all too easily become us as we find ourselves before the judge. And the ultimate outcome of all that they sought to achieve in life, the outcome of all the money that they made and the cars that they owned, the outcome of the 401k and the investment account, as they stand before the one true judge, is a life in an eternity separated from God in a place where fire eats the flesh and they live in the forever that they chose for themselves. I'm not trying to scare you. I'm just telling you what it says in James 5. Do not allow your wealth to become your ultimate hope, your, your faux eternal treasure, because there's going to come a day when you and I too stand before the judge. And if your hope is in your stuff and not in Jesus, then the emptiness that you already are beginning to feel right now on earth is going to characterize your life for all eternity. And I don't want that for you. And I don't want that for me. And I don't believe that Jesus wants that for you either. Because he is the supreme treasure. He's the ultimate source of hope. He is to our souls the only true wealth. The only one who can truly satisfy for all eternity. And there's no striving and there's no stretching to earn Jesus. He's not a limited resource. He's not a zero-sum game. There's plenty of him to go around and no need for any of us to have any less of him than the next person. Because he is true wealth. He is a currency of the Spirit that has paid for your life with His own blood and has now made a way for your citizenship in His new kingdom where moths cannot destroy and thieves cannot break in and steal and where death cannot have a hold because your treasure was not laid up in things that are perishable but is laid up in Him for eternity. The second uh, point from James 5 today is that wealth oppresses when it causes us to treat people as less than the supreme beings of God's creation that they are. I know that's a lot to write. If you didn't get one of those little note cards, you can always go back and grab one of those if you don't want to try and write all that down. Look, the wages that you failed to pay, it says in verse 4, to the workers who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. In the time that James is writing, which was before the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem in AD 70, there was an increasing problem of a small group of wealthy individuals and families who were amassing the majority of the land and the other revenue streams in and around modern day Israel. And the disparity, the distance between the wealthy and the working class was becoming an increasingly wide chasm. And not unlike today, the wealthy who found themselves in such a position were guilty of taking advantage of their workers. And so James says in response to this practice of taking advantage of the wealthy, taking advantage of the poor, that the wages that were due to the workers are actually crying out and have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. It's kind of a weird picture to think about, money crying out to God, but it's not unlike in Genesis 4 when Abel's blood cries out to God from the ground after Cain has spilled it. It's as if the biblical witness from Genesis all the way now up into James is saying that no act of injustice goes unpunished or acknowledged by God. That even if we think that God doesn't see it, that the Lord of hosts, meaning the God of heaven's armies, hears these things and he's preparing an army against the rich who oppress the poor. Today, there exist entire industries whose business plans include taking advantage of the poor and fleecing them for profit. 
This doesn't even include major corporations that benefit from things like child labor in foreign countries. This is from Wikipedia, so take it or leave it, but here you go. The term poverty industry, which means like entire industries that are built on taking advantage of the poor, or poverty business, refer to a wide range of money-making activities that attract a large portion of their business from poor individuals. Businesses in the poverty industry often include payday loan centers, pawn shops, rent-to-own centers, casinos, liquor stores, lotteries, tobacco stores, credit card companies, bail bond services, illegal ventures such as loan sharking might also be included. The poverty industry makes roughly $33 billion a year in the United States. And elected American federal officials receive more than $1.5 million in campaign contributions from poverty industry donors on a yearly basis. Now compare that reality to the over 2,000 verses in the Bible that reference things like caring for the poor, commanding us as God's people to do things such as give to the poor from our excess or contribute to systems that support people, not that take advantage of them. Give people the money, the wages that they're due. Avoid taking advantage of people for profit and about a hundred, excuse me, about 1,996 others that you can go find for yourself in Scripture. If God's heart is for the poor, then ours have to be too. When our pursuit of wealth and security causes us to treat people as if their value is anything less than those created in the image of God, as image bearers of the Creator Himself, we've begun to be oppressed by our own wealth. You can say what you want about what the best way to care for the poor is, and that's a valuable discussion. That's a worthy conversation. But if my schedule and my pursuit of a career and doing everything I can to keep up with the Joneses, especially in a small community like this, to my refusal to acknowledge the least of these, the people that I'm living around that are in need, then I'm living in sin. Then I've become oppressed by my own wealth when I see people on the side of the road with signs or in lied at food pantries and I think to myself first about how they probably made bad choices to put themselves there instead of how Jesus' passionate heart yearns for that person, desires for, for them to know the spiritual wealth, the overflow that comes through faith in Him. Right? When, when I see people in need and I think first judgment or, or condemnation, I, I've actually allowed my own wealth and my own lifestyle, my own desires to actually cause me to sin against them. And so if you go to Acts chapter 2 and onward and you read about the early church, you'll see that God's picture towards the poor is that the people would literally sell their possessions for those in need so that no one would be lacking among them. Like, what would our church look like if we knew someone didn't have enough food and we just started selling cars? I'll lower the bar a little bit. What would it look like just in our community if those of us who call ourselves Christians were actively seeking out opportunities to be generous? What if we put a little line in all of our budgets, however much that is appropriate for the season of life that you're in, maybe it's $5 a month right now, and just labeled it generosity? How much would things just in the center point Urbana area change if we were just looking for ways to help people, like actively seeking, desiring to serve. How many people do you think we get inside these doors, not because they want something from us, but because they saw a group of people who were actively fighting to be generous, to give their money away, and they could see a kind of joy in us as we gave away from our excess, and they think to themselves, something is different about those people, and I want to know what it is. How many people would come to know the supreme wealth of their joy being rooted in a Savior's blood in an empty tomb if we would start to see our wealth as a tool instead of a goal? All right, and finally, wealth oppresses when it turns our hearts against Christ and His creation. Verses 5 and 6 say, You have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened yourselves in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the innocent one who was not opposing you. John Calvin says of the purpose of this section of James 5, he says that it has a regard to the faithful, that's, that's us, that they, hearing of the miserable end of the rich, might not envy their fortune. 
and also knowing that God would be the avenger of the wrongs they suffered, that they might with a calm and resigned mind bear them. So we are called both not to envy the fortunes of the rich, and I'll argue in a second that there's a specific reason for that, and we're called to trust that when we've seen oppressive injustice or felt it ourselves, that God will bring justice that we can take hope and refuge in the fact that even in the midst of our suffering, as Noah testified to earlier, that there's not a moment that God doesn't see us and that he's coming back and he's going to make all things right. And there's also a message in the midst of this condemnation of the unrighteous rich of inexpressible hope that in suffering we have Jesus. What happens to us when we become envious of wealth? We turn our hearts against the righteous one. Historically, there have been two main schools of thought that this reference to the righteous one in James 5 and James 5, 6, that it either means we've turned our hearts against innocent people in general or that we've turned our hearts against Jesus as the supreme, the ultimate righteous one. I think there's really good arguments on both sides based on the context and on the Greek. Ultimately, if the reference is simply to the oppression of the innocent, then, then we can see that James is just really trying to drive home this point that wealth leads to a twisting and even a murdering of human beings made in God's image. But on the other hand, if many of the medieval and the colonial area theologians are correct, that if James is referencing here the rich elites who persecuted and murdered Jesus of Nazareth. And so ultimately, the pursuit of wealth above the pursuit of Jesus is sinful, it's idolatry, and it leads us to a life of unrequited desires, seeking to fill a space in our life, in our identity, that only Jesus can fill, and it's the same kind of sin and greed that put him on the cross in the first place. For there is no real comfort, and no real security, and no real fulfillment outside of a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. But all too often we treasure the created things more than we treasure the creator himself. And this is not a new problem. The things that were designed to actually point us back to God, to help us to love him more and experience his love for us more, the things that were designed to give us a reverence and a worship of the creator, they've actually taken the place of lordship in our hearts. And that problem is not a new one. Romans 125 says this of the condition of the heart. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served created things rather than the Creator who is forever praised. Amen. The superiority of wealth is a lie. And, and please, don't get me lo- please don't get me wrong. I love this country. I would not want to live anywhere else in the world. But since its inception, the American dream has seeped itself into our understanding of the gospel in unhealthy ways. The gospel is not about what Jesus can get you. It's not about what Jesus can do for you. It's not as the prayers go up, the blessings come down. Lots of times the prayers go up and blessings don't come down. This lie of the prosperity gospel that if you would simply believe a little bit more or give a little bit more that you're somehow going to become wealthy or that God's going to make all of your problems magically go away, especially the material problems, it's just not true. Instead, what we get, the wealth that we receive is actually far greater. That what does come is a relationship with the one who makes all earthly wealth look like mold and dust. The one who is altogether lovely, who is altogether holy, who is perfect, and whose presence should be our supreme desire. Your sin, like mine, like the sin of the rich and the elites in power in the Jewish hierarchy of Jerusalem 2,000 years ago, condemned a righteous man who did not resist who was led like a lamb to slaughter, silent as he stood before his accusers. And today in our greed, we have made excuses for that same sin of idolizing wealth. In our pursuit of holiness as a church, how different would things look if we didn't just disregard the sins that we like too much, the sins that we want to be able to keep, like loving our money more than we love Jesus and our neighbors? What would it look like if we didn't just treat those sins as slip-ups or just part of who we are and instead viewed them as siding with Satan on the issue of wealth? 
I think we're called to a level of accountability here. And I, I love you enough to tell you the truth. I have a friend uh, named Caleb. He disciples a lot of college-aged men and, and women. And specifically when he's talking to young men, he will say when someone confesses to him about things like engaging in the sin of pornography, he won't just say like, oh, you slipped up, you'll get him next time, champ. He won't just say like, oh, that's just part of who you are. No, what he'll actually say is what you did in that moment was you sided with Satan on the issue of sexuality and the value of women. You objectified people who were created in the image of God and you inadvertently contributed to the sex trafficking industry. Now, what would our hearts look like if we called out sin like that when we side with Satan on the issue of wealth? Like, What would it look like if when I valued my material possessions more than I valued Jesus, you called me out like that? What would it look like when we refuse to be generous to our neighbors to turn and to treat them as Jesus wants them to be treated? When we turn and we treat them as less important than ourselves, what would it look like if we held ourselves to that level of accountability, to loving our neighbors and to loving God more than we love our stuff? Listen, none of that money was yours in the first place. It's not mine either. God has entrusted us with it to to steward it. And so instead of envying what others have, we're called to look on our own wealth with the joy of having our ultimate treasure, knowing that our ultimate hope is waiting for us in heaven and asking ourselves, okay, God, how are you going to use my bank account for your glory? Being reminded that the King of Kings did not come to earth as a wealthy elite or as some religious leader. He showed up on the scene as the son of a poor carpenter's family. He was born in a manger. He lived his entire life provided for by God alone through the generosity of others, entering each town he met as empty-handed as he did the last. And that man, that Savior God, calls us not to envy the wealth, but actually to look upon the wealthy with pity. For the things in which they place their hope are fading away. The inheritance that they have set for themselves is going to die with them. But for those of us that are in Christ, for those of us who have known the surpassing joy of meeting Jesus, the one who died on a cross to take our sins but did not stay there and instead rose and ascended into heaven to secure for us an eternal inheritance. An inheritance that First Peter says is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven, waiting for you. And so I'll end today with a final question. What would it look like for you? Would you today step out from under the oppression of wealth and step into what's been prepared for you as the sons and daughters, the the rightful owners of the inheritance of the King Jesus? Would you pray with me? Lord God, maker of heaven and earth, would we hold with open hands the things that you have given to us, the the people in our lives, Lord, the the time in our calendars, the the money in our bank accounts, Lord, the, the wealth in our investments, God, would we hold it all with open hands, knowing, God, that it's not ours, but it's yours, that it's for you to take and to use as you would wish, and that, God, no matter what that number says at the end of the month when we get our bank statement, we can trust and we can hope that even when we're suffering, that your heart is for the poor in spirit, that your heart is for those who are in need, those who are sick and know that they need a doctor, Lord, that your heart is for the broken and the weeping, that we have all been those who have fallen short of the glory of God, and yet that through your Son, Jesus, you have prepared for us an eternal inheritance that surpasses all all earthly wealth that God there is something waiting for us on that day that is going to take away every tear and every sorrow and every pain and that we will rejoice with you in heaven forever Lord would you place the joy of that wealth upon our hearts today and would you help us Lord to go out and to be bearers of that message of hope the supreme and ultimate wealth that comes only through Jesus Christ would you help us Lord to share that message today We ask and we pray these things 
In Jesus' name, amen.